Hi, thanks for joining us at Church Online at Warmbrook Community Church. I'm Ryan Layden. Happy Easter to you. Thank you for making us a part of your Easter celebration this year. Uh, this is going to be a different Easter for all of us. Um, why is that? Well, number one, most of you are here. It's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, probably the, for the last 10 years, I think this is probably the biggest Easter Sunday we've had as a church. Uh, most of you are not down south. Uh, no one's camping, really. And, and most of you, um, none of you actually, are in Bali. So everybody's here. Even if we're not physically present, it's great to know that our church is celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ together today. Thank you for being a part of that. Today we're gonna to focus our whole service really around answering and thinking through one big question. What does the empty tomb of Jesus Christ mean to me? We're gonna be talking about that in lots of different ways. You're gonna get the opportunity today to hear from some of the people that are a part of your church, that are part of Warmbrook Community Church, who have sent in their thoughts in little video clips and uh, we've put them in, we're gonna sprinkle them in through the service as we go through, just so that you can remember that, you know what, this, uh, our church is still there, we're still all active together, and we are interested today in really getting deep into that question, what does the empty tomb of Jesus Christ mean to me? To help us get into that, and we're gonna have a time of worship. Uh, prior to this time of, of worship, of singing, of praising God's name, uh, I want you to see a, a little, a few of the answers that some of our, our video people have given us uh, trying to answer this question as we prepare ourselves for worship today. Let's pray together and we'll get right into it. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together in the name of Jesus today. Thank you, Lord, that we are the people of the resurrection, that we are people that, whose faith is built not on on some idol, not on some past philosophy, but on the living Savior. Lord, we are called by your name, and today we are gathered in your name, and we are going to praise your name. Lord, help us to do that together even now. So in your name we pray, amen. Let's worship together. Empty tomb to me uh, indicates hope and uh, just joy, really. That's what it means for me, Jesus is alive. The God that we serve is a living God. We can, we can talk to him, we can pray to him, and he can hear us, and he listens to our prayers, and he wants relationship with us. It, to me, it means that Jesus has risen. And uh, that even death, even death on a cross, uh, couldn't stop him. Uh, death and sin, my sin, nailed to a cross. So what does Resurrection Sunday mean to me? It means everything. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of
was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you But not alive All my failures I try to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave My sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the end The 
good Lord has come to see and say He's our rescuer He's our rescuer We are free from sin forevermore Oh how sweet the sound Oh how grace abounds We will praise the Lord our rescuer He is beauty for the blind man
tomb is a reminder of just how good God's plan is and that it's at work even when I don't see what's happening or I don't understand. We have everlasting life because Jesus Christ was risen from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father and I'm so ever thankful for that. It means that Jesus is who he said he was, the Son of God with power over sin and death. That shows me that Jesus is greater than our failure. And because of that, we can have a relationship with God again. Isn't it great that we are able to join together today in our church online celebration at Easter? Thank you for being a part of this together. Uh, as we are learning what it looks like to do church together online, uh, I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful in your giving to the work of the church. I know it's easy when we're separated and we're far apart to sort of get into, um, into different habits, to get into different rhythms. And one of the things that we need to do is to remember to be faithful to each other and to be faithful to God in the way that we use the blessings that God gives us. For those of us that are fortunate, that, uh, that have income coming in, that have jobs, it is an opportunity for us to be, to be generous while we're also being careful uh, so if you would like to give online, if that's something that you are interested in doing, feeling called by God to continue in that faithfulness, uh, we would encourage you to go, number one, to our app. It's a great place to go. Uh, you can find all the information that you need about uh, the church online videos. Uh, there's audio podcasts of the messages. There's uh, lots of different ways that you can communicate and connect with the church. There's our social media pages are all found there as well as the two different giving options. The ability to give to our general offering, which pays for the staff and the things that are still working and running around the church, and also the building fund, which is that tax-deferred uh, account that's being used to help us complete our massive building project. So uh, we just want to encourage you in that and uh, to continue to be a part of it. Also, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see uh, these little signs popping up all over the place, the, uh, the praying for you sign. 
Um, if, you, if you have the opportunity to maybe print one of these out, stick it on your front window at your house, that'd be fantastic. Send us a picture of it. Uh, put that up on the uh, Warmbird Church Facebook page. It'd be really neat to see how you are letting your neighbors know that you're praying for them. And also, as you come home, as you take a walk around the block or whatever, as you see these signs, uh, it's a great reminder for us to be in prayer for those around us. And lastly, I want to encourage you at the end of this message, at the end of this time together, to go and to take, take uh, the resources that we've provided on our kids and youth pages uh, that are found on the warmbird.org.au website. You can go there and, uh, and find all sorts of great stuff that is available for our kids and our youth, especially on Easter. Uh, they've put a ton of time and energy into providing these resources. I would just encourage you to spend some time getting into that. If you're in the youth group, if you're, uh, if you're watching this and you're part of our youth group, you can go there yourself. I know you know how to use your phones. Uh, go on to warmbird.org.au, find the youth group, connect page and see what's there, engage with that and continue to be a part of the Zoom calls and be a part of uh, what we're doing as a church together. Well, listen, uh, today is really about, again, this celebration of Easter, the opportunity for us to celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us. And the way that we're going to get into that today is by tackling this big question, the big question of what does the empty tomb mean to me? My goal in this conversation today is for all of us to have an answer to that question. You know, what does the empty tomb actually mean to you? What does it mean uh, for you and I living today as followers of Christ to celebrate the empty tomb? So to, to help us get into that, to really get focused, uh, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be looking at a particular conversation that Jesus had with a couple of his disciples and out of that conversation, I hope that we'll find some answers for what does the empty tomb mean. So we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 26, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 24, verses 13 to 19. Let's look at that together. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said, uh, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. And so we're gonna stop at this point and we're gonna really try to understand what it is that we're reading, see what, what's going on in this particular conversation between Jesus and two of his disciples. It begins, we see, with Jesus uh, and with these two disciples walking from Jerusalem to the little village of Emmaus. Uh, I know I've always heard it as Emmaus. Uh, I was corrected by when I was last there that no, no, it's, it's like the thing that crawls along the ground. It's a mouse, a mouse. That's how you're supposed to say it apparently. Who knows? Uh, so they were walking to this place and they were doing what seemed natural. You know, for most of you that are trying to take walks around the block, trying to get out of the house, if you're walking with somebody, you generally are talking with them. And so in this situation, these two were walking to this village together and they were talking about the only thing that they knew how to talk about at this time, right? They were talking about the events of the Holy Week and the events that, of the week that had just passed for them. Looking back at some of the things that Jesus had done in the previous week, uh, looking back at their time together at Passover when they shared the Passover meal in the upper room, uh, talking about all that had happened that night with the Garden of Gethsemane and the arrest of Jesus and the trial. And oh, do you remember when Peter chopped that guy's ear off? Yeah, that was wild. And Jesus healed him. Yeah, man, that's crazy. And so they were just talking about all the things that had been happening and then talking about the struggle of Saturday when Jesus was in that borrowed tomb. And then no doubt talking about the very thing that happened that morning, the very thing that they'd heard about that morning. And so they were, they were talking amongst themselves and then this traveler comes along and uh, thankfully the gospel of Luke makes it clear to us that the traveler is Jesus Christ and he he's prevents them from being able to see who he is and he begins to talk to them about what it is that they're going on, about what they're talking about. 
And I love how Luke describes this. He says it in a way that's really uh, shows you the actual image, right? It says they were walking along with their heads down, right? They were walking along, they're feeling the weight of their, their moment, they're feeling depressed and sad. They had their heads down and, and this traveler comes along and says, what are you talking about? And then in that moment, they lift their heads, right? They lift their heads and they look at this traveler like he's from outer space. Who is this person? It's essentially like if you were walking along the beach today and you, you met somebody, you know, keeping a safe distance from them, of course, you met somebody on the beach and, and you started to talk to them about, oh, isn't it weird how, how things have changed? And, and if they just kind of looked at you and were like, what, what's going on? I, I've not heard anything. What, what is this about a virus? You'd, you'd kind of want to smack them and say like, what rock did you just crawl out from under? And that's how these guys looked at this, this person. And you can tell because they're kind of sarcastic with Jesus, which I understand, I kind of get that. Uh, they were sarcastic. Listen to what they said. They said, are you the only one? All right, are you the only person who was just in Jerusalem? Imagine this place, it was packed for Passover. They're saying, are you the only person visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know about the things that have happened? All right, it's a pretty sarcastic response to a guy that's going, hey guys, what are you talking about? And they're like, Whoa, who are you? And I love that Jesus is not easily offended, right? He, he didn't get his feelings hurt and walk away. Instead, he, he baited them, which is kind of fun. He baited them into talking to them about what it is that they really believed. You know, what did they see? Who was Jesus to them? And so he asked them, he goes, I don't know, you know, what things? Tell me what's been going on. And so we hear a little bit about that conversation next. If we look back at verse 19 and we read through uh, to verse 24. Jesus said, what things? They answered, about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. So here again, we have the disciples uh, telling the story of what really was going on in this holy week, the events that led to Good Friday and eventually led to the celebration of Easter Sunday. Essentially what they were saying was that Jesus was Messiah in our eyes. He was the Christ. We believed he was the one that was sent by God to bring the redemption of Israel, but it didn't work out, right? They began to talk about how he was accused and how he had been uh, brought up on false charges in an illegal trial and that how he had been beaten and brought before Pilate and Herod and how they had, they had just turned them over to the, the the weight of the crowd, the crowd was screaming, crucify him, how they nailed Jesus to the cross and, and how he died. You know, and they, they were recounting the fact that he was, he was not with them anymore. He was buried in that borrowed tomb, the tomb of Joseph. So they began to talk about that. They began to talk about how, listen, today, in this very day, our, our people left to go back to that tomb and to take care of the body of our friend, Jesus. And when they got there, his body wasn't there and there were these angels. The women said that there were these angels and you know, they weren't sure about that. And so they sent some of their other friends. They sent Peter and John and other people down to the tomb and, and there again, they, they found that the, the body was gone but nobody had seen Jesus. Right? They did, these two didn't know, they weren't sure. You know, they wanted to believe, they really wanted to believe that, that Jesus had somehow escaped death, that he was out of the tomb for real but I can tell, you can just tell in the, the way that they were behaving and the way that they're talking that they didn't know what to make of the empty tomb, right? It didn't make sense to them. Was it possible? Yeah, but was it likely? No. And so it's interesting, the traveler then goes on and he begins to speak to them and explain to them the meaning of the question of what is going on with the empty tomb. So let's look at Luke chapter 24. Let's look at verse 25 to 34. 
He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So Jesus came to these two disciples, came to these two who believed and who were walking, and they, and Jesus came to them to try to help them answer this important question of what does the empty tomb mean for them? So Jesus helped them understand this uh, by explaining to them again all that had happened, working back through everything that had gone on, all of the events that had taken place, and showing them how none of this was a surprise to God, showing them that God had made it open and clear and obvious in the words of the Hebrew Bible through the words of the prophets. He had made it clear to them that this was going to be God's plan of salvation for all people. And Jesus would have sat and talked with them about these things as they, as they were going along. He would have explained to them, you know, you remember this passage? Remember when Isaiah said this? Remember what Jeremiah said? Remember Micah's words? You know, and explaining that, don't you remember what the Bible has taught you about the Messiah? And surely this is what Jesus did. Jesus came to these two to teach them very clearly the meaning of the empty tomb. So the events of the empty tomb, again, they weren't a surprise to God. They weren't, they weren't tragic. It wasn't sad from, from God's perspective. This was always the plan, the plan of salvation. So Jesus came and spoke to these, these two for a, spe, a particular reason, to explain to them that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those promises. And he's the fulfillment of the Passover. He's the fulfillment of the atonement. He's the fulfillment of all of those festivals and celebrations we've been talking about for the last few weeks. He is the one that John the Baptist said so clearly when he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I want us next to talk about two more big ideas about what does it look like for us to understand the meaning of the empty tomb and to do that, we're gonna to need to take a little trip. Hey, thanks for uh, coming along. So we're gonna to get to the next part of our discussion around the big question of what does the empty tomb mean to me and mean to you uh, by talking about a gift that's given to us in the empty tomb. But you might be wondering, Ryan, why are you in Singleton on top of the observation point? That's a weird place to go. You know, a lot of weird things happen up there. Yeah, I know. All right, so this is the highest point I know of around that I'm allowed to go, right? So, and you can see out a long way. And the reason why I brought you here to have this next discussion is because we're talking about eternity. You see, the gift that we are given by Christ in the empty tomb really is that of eternal life. When you and I, when we believe in Jesus, when we call on the name of Jesus, when we engage with Christ and we accept his gift of salvation, uh, we are not just asking him to come into our existing life and clean us up. Okay, we're not asking Jesus to give us reincarnation, to help us do have a good do-over if we do a, this life wrong. Instead, what we are getting from Jesus when we call on his name by faith, when we receive his gift of salvation, is we're being given his new life, his eternal life. Now that's significant, right? Because what we are being given is a life that is radically different from ours, right? We die to self when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We acknowledge that we are dead because of sin and that we need new life. And that's what Jesus gives us. And that's what we see 
in the empty tomb. The empty tomb gives us evidence that Jesus can and will make good on his promise to provide all who call on him by faith this gift of eternal life. Look, the second thing I want to talk to you about that we see in the empty tomb as a gift is that little word means a big thing. It's called hope. You know, when I, when I think about the cross, I don't immediately think of hope, right? To me, the cross doesn't make me think of hope. It makes me think of sacrifice, makes me think of atonement, makes me think of, uh, of death and suffering because of my failure. That's not hopeful to me. The Saturday after Good Friday, that's the day of silence to me. It, it, it's that same question that we all ask from time to time, where is God? Uh, what is God doing when I'm suffering? What is, what is happening? What is God's plan when it looks like things are out of control? Uh, but on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, we see in the empty tomb, we see the example of hope, real hope. I can trust in the gift and the promise of Christ. I can trust in his offer of salvation. I can trust in his work done for me on the cross because he has defeated death. And he is now able to give to any and all who ask his gift of new life. That brings hope. Now I've got one more point for you, and it's going to require us to go on another little bit of a trip. Okay, so come on, let's go there next. So the third point, when we're talking about finding the value, the meaning of the empty tomb, for me, it can be seen in a place like this. And you're like, really? There's nothing there. Uh, this place represents for me an important part of all of our lives. It represents work. It represents what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, our production, what we do with our hands, what we do with our minds, how we take care of the people around us, what we do with our everyday lives. See, eternal life makes our everyday life blossom with meaning. It makes it explode with meaning because what we have in this life, what we have today, we will never have again. You know, and I believe in this gift of, of heaven. I believe in this gift of eternal life. I believe that because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, I have that hope of heaven. But that doesn't mean that today is meaningless for me and that all I should do is put all of my hope into the future. In fact, the opposite is true. See, God's word teaches me that today matters because it is today that I have the ability to impact others with the love of Christ, the grace and the mercy of Christ. And it's today that I have the ability to live for Christ, to give God uh, glory in my work, glory in the way that I work with other people, the words that I say, the things that I do. It is today that I'm able to do something of value and meaning and worship to God that doesn't mean that eternal life is going to be devoid of that value. In fact, it's going to be manifold, expressly huge amounts more than what we experience today. But all I know is today, and all I have in front of me is today. I can worry about tomorrow, I can do all those other things, but today is all I am given. In eternal life, the gift of Jesus Christ gives today value. It makes today more meaningful for me. See, I don't place my value in my bank account in my house, in my car, in my good looks, none of that stuff. I see that I have been given true purpose and value because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. He has taken my shame. He has taken my failure upon himself on the cross because he loves me. Not because I'm worth it. Not because I've done anything to earn it. But because God loves me so much. He sent his one and only into the world so that all who should believe in him and call on him will receive the gift of eternal life. That is the meaning, right? That's the value. That's the gift of the empty tomb. It is real purpose, real mission, and real value. Look, I hope that that's what you have. I hope that you are living in real value and real meaning and real purpose. But listen, if you're not, if you want to start this life and you want to begin to live this eternal life given to you by Christ, it's as simple as just asking, calling on the name of Jesus by faith. If you want some help with that, I'm going to pray in just a second. You can join me in that. Let's pray together. Let's ask God to give our lives today value and meaning because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the empty tomb. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me, for taking on to the cross my sin, my shame, and my failure. Lord Jesus, thank you for the empty tomb. 
Thank you for showing us, demonstrating to us that you have the power to fulfill your promise. When you promise us eternal life, you have proven it in your defeat of death and sin. Lord Jesus, I trust in you. I hope in you. And Lord, I I give you all that I am today and for all of eternity. Lord, we believe in you and we give you thanks. Amen. Hey, listen, if you've if you prayed that prayer with me, if you have started this journey of faith with Jesus Christ, you don't do it alone. I know that we're all socially distant at the moment, uh, but you can you can comment, you can email, you can reach out to a neighbor, you can tell somebody, you can call the church, you can do whatever and ask for some help in this journey that you've just started, this new life that you are going to be living as a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, grab yourself a Bible, get you a Bible app off the internet, find something like that. Uh, follow us on Facebook, follow us in other churches like us that are Bible teaching, Bible believing Christian churches, and start the journey of faith and growth today. Listen, I hope we see you soon, uh, but until then, God bless you. Have a great Easter. Be sure to stick around and watch some of the other videos that follow on after this about what other people in the life of Warmer Community Church said when we asked them, what does the empty tomb mean to you? God bless you. See you soon. I don't have to fear death anymore because he's overcome the grave and he's defeated death. And I don't have to fear that anymore for myself or for my loved ones. The empty tomb fills me with hope and joy that Jesus is not dead, that he's risen and alive. He died on the cross for me and rose again so that I might have eternal life. I think the empty tomb represents the power of God to change our lives. We were once empty, searching for an answer for truth and forgiveness. And without the empty tomb, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we would not have freedom, we wouldn't have hope, and we would not have salvation. The empty tomb means for me the fulfilment of God's rescue for us. If he can do that, he can do absolutely anything. Empty tomb